What? I'm Sam Power. And I'm Violet. I'm Luke. I'm Lawson. Oh. And welcome to our daily talk show. Manon de Jour. Today on Manon de Jour, we're going to be discussing John Cassavetes' debut film, Shadows, which was released in 1959. The movie highlights race relations in New York City. The film stars Ben Caruthers, Lilia Goldani, and Hugh Hurd as three African-American siblings and depicts their lives over a period of two weeks. So, oh, what did you guys think of the film? I personally really liked it. Um, I, I really thought it was, it was pretty cool. Um, my favorite part about the movie was the soundtrack. Uh, especially um, because it was uh, jazz cent centered on jazz and um, which is kind of cool because jazz came out of New York City um, primarily in the 1950s so it was kind of cool to like take a trip into history because like with independent films like that it's usually like on the time period that um, is being filmed. So it kind of gave us like a real life capture of what was going on, like not only with what it looked like, but also what it sounded like in New York City in the 1950s. Yeah, I, I really like this movie as well. I think you can see all of the influence that this had on other directors. Mm. Um, like I think you can very clearly like so many great movies take from this movie um and i think it's just really great i my favorite parts were like there were some scenes that were just so great like mm. um when when the three guys are like sitting down all drinking beers and every time they sit they like put their their beer back down and like really loudly bang it on the table and i think there's just like so many scenes that were like so weird and great in it um, and I really loved it. Uh, yeah, I also enjoyed the film. My favorite part was watching uh, Benny's character develop throughout the film. Um, he started out as like, sort of like a beat guy, just trying to like pick up chicks in, in bars and restaurants. And he ended up paying for it, getting beat up at the end of the film. And he kind of like changed his ways I don't know. That was my favorite part. Yeah, it was a uh, it was an interesting movie. It wasn't. I wouldn't say it was my favorite movie, um, but uh, I can see how it's a, definitely an important movie for the film industry. Um, just kind of setting the stage for like talking about race and um, in movies and films, and just like the low budget of it um, is a really good important movie. Um, but it's definitely. Uh, not for everyone, I think, because I thought it was an interesting movie, but I just didn't personally enjoy the plot as much. It just, I felt like it just didn't really go anywhere for me, but I don't know. That was just my opinion. Um, so I think something that we all have come to agreement on is like race is one of the most important aspects of this film. Um, but I think what makes Cassavetti's movie so amazing and so groundbreaking is really the intersectionality aspect of it, that you really understand that race isn't the only thing that these characters deal with in life, um, especially for Lilia. Like you can clearly see gender is such an impactful part of her character. And like as a female, that's really what stood out to me the most in the film. And I think that each person uses their unique intersectionality to relate to this film which is why so many people love it because I think you can really take so many things out of each character whether it be like career wise with Hugh sexuality wise with Lilia or like um kind of like Ben is like struggling in life to like grow up and deal with like adulthood um and so I think that there's like lots of different things that you can like relate to so I think like that's a really um, important aspect of the film. I, I think that's spot on because I think what we gravitate towards initially, it's pretty obvious that he's uh, 
hinting at racial dynamics in the 1950s. Um, it's, and it kind of reminded me similar to that of Suture um, because uh, the sister didn't appear to be black um, and it was later found out that she was, which was why he had that super um, outrageous reaction, in my opinion, about it. And he just wanted to get out of there and didn't want to see her again, really. But anyways, I think that another thing that he was also commenting on, like you said, was uh, uh, dynamics between different genders. Um, because I thought it was pretty stereotypical uh, the gender roles in the movie. Um, the men, like there was one scene in particular I thought was was kind of pertinent to today when, uh, what was the brother's name? Danny? Or no? Ben or Hugh? Um, Hugh. Hugh was the musician. Hugh, Hugh. Yeah. When Hugh was talking to, um, uh, what's her name? Lelia. Lelia. Um, and he was saying like he wanted to buy her a cab um, to go home because it wasn't safe to walk out at night. Um, I thought that was super interesting because it applies to today as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think something that can really be shown from that is you know, this kind of feels like, although it's it's very like, maybe the dialogue isn't as natural, the movie itself feels very realistic. Like mm. the scene in which Lelia does go home and the guy tries to harass her on the street when she's outside of the movie theater, that scene kind of just happens and then it cuts to a new scene and it's never discussed, it's never talked about. She runs away and that's the end of it. I think that's very true to how women live life in the way that they get harassed on the street. I mean, I've experienced it, I'm sure all women have, where you get harassed on the street and then you keep walking and it's everyday life. There's mm -hmm. never any resolution to it. Um, and I think that scene felt very like, that scene stuck out to me a lot because the way in which it was so disruptive, this kind of aggressive scene happens where she gets assaulted. And then the movie just continues on without ever discussing it. Feels like very mm -hmm. true to real life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing in this movie um, that I kind of took away from it was just, I thought it was really important, the parallels between like racial identity, like then in the 50s and now, and they're still very similar. Like this movie is still like, even though it's really old, it still speaks like volumes with like racial identity, like issues in the present. Like with Benny, for example, just how he was like always struggling. He was hanging out with a lot of white people and he almost tried to act like white. And so did, um, what was it, Lay Layla? I can never Layla, say. Yeah. Layla. Yeah. I know, I'm always uh, like, like her name should be Layla. <laughs> yeah, um, but how they, those two were always like trying to hang out with predominantly with white like social groups. Um, and they seem like they're kind of struggling to find, especially Benny, struggling to find their identity as like a person and just a black person in society. So I just feel like there's a lot of parallels with that today because a lot of black people are really expressing themselves in their identity with the Black Lives Matter. So I thought it was very, there was an important like tie between like back then and today and how it's still like very similar with racial identity and stuff like that. Yeah, I originally didn't realize that Ben was the other brother. I thought that Rupert was the other brother because he's he's very white passing. Yeah. Um, even in films where it's not black and white and in color, he doesn't look black. He's very white passing. He looks maybe Hispanic or something. So mm. I originally didn't think that that was the other brother um, of Lelia's until like, when they kind of explained it and I put it together. Another interesting thing, I, um, which also is part of why I really like this film, was um, just like the character development of uh, the brothers is kind of like showed their music journey. 
Um, and it was kind of cool to look into that a little bit because um, the jazz scene in New York in the 1950s is predominantly um, African American. Um, it was a, a lot of African American musicians at the time uh, were jazz musicians. So I thought it was kind of cool to just see their journey throughout. Um, and another thing I wanted to comment about was the scene where the women were dancing. Um, and it just kind of like left me unsettled because if you looked around the room as this, the camera panned across the room, you saw that it was a lot of males that were just standing around in the corners, just kind of like critiquing them. And I feel like throughout the entire movie, like females weren't really looked at as like a actual character, but more as like, like a way to get ahead for the male characters, if you know what I'm saying. Like, because it pretty much focused on the men trying to go after the women for pretty much the entire film and never like gave us the perspective of the females and what they thought about that. Yeah, there's, there's one scene where Lelia says like, I forget what it was, I should have written down the quote. She says something about like, um, she's, oh, the two guys are fighting over who's gonna take her home. Mm. And she says like, actually, I'm gonna take myself home. And I think that Lelia's whole journey is not necessarily about the men in her life, but more about her discovering the fact that she has power over men and like yes. you really see that at the end when she's like dancing with the guy who takes her out on the date she's and he's kind of like I've never seen a woman act like this like this isn't how women are supposed to act and she's mm -hmm. like like fuck off <laughs> like this yeah. me. I'm not going to be controlled by you like I'm an individual person um and I think that that was like a really great like arc in her story because she was always feisty but I think she really became like like such a strong woman um and like the way that she could like tease a man mm. where she was like I'm not ready yet I'm not ready yet and was like openly laughing at him and humiliating him and he makes a comment about her being masculine which I thought was really funny because it's the whole idea that because she's like demanding, she's masculine. And like, mm. because she's like powerful, she's masculine. And like defining that trait as like a gender is really, it, that part just made me laugh a lot. <laughs> she was um, like, I'm not masculine. <laughs> that's so true. Like I was even chuckling during the film at that as well. Um, and tying into what you just said, um, and we were talking about this a little bit before the discussion started, but um, the lyrics of the song um, that they were singing, that was like kind of, it was kind of weird. A real mad chick is like a lollipop. She'll keep you on the stick. She'll play you for a fool. And I really, I don't know if this, well, everything in film is intentional as we've learned, even with independent films. So personally, I feel like the meaning behind this specific line that's repeated over and over and over again is although it may seem as though the men are the ones who are trying to like control the women, in the end, it's the women who end up controlling the men. Um, like the women get the men on the stick. With, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but um, just, I thought it was kind of funny, like, because all the male characters were kept on the stick by the women they're pursuing, so. What did you guys think about, like, using New York as, like, kind of his, like, Cassavetti's playground for this film? Especially in tandem with this being, like, an independent, low-budget film. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for being a low budget film, it really worked great. Pretty much the two main settings were throughout New York and then Lelia's apartment. And those were the majority of, like that made up the majority of the whole film. So using New York, it really made it feel like there was a lot of different places 
that they were when it was really just a couple different streets, I'm sure. And the hustle and bustle of New York's everyday activity uh, made a good backdrop for the film. Yeah, it was definitely kind of like um, like one of the points in like a low budget film, I think was like, like use like a recognizable landscape um, or something like that along those lines. And it was definitely kind of neat to see like in one of the beginning first scenes of the movie, you could see like, like there was like a Broadway sign and it was like instantly I was like, oh yeah, that's definitely New York City and the hustle and bustle, like the taxis and stuff. So that definitely, it definitely played a important part in like the film, like developing and just setting the stage for like these characters, storylines and stuff like that. So I thought that was very interesting. I kind of enjoyed seeing, I, I liked the scenes where they were in the streets the best for me. Yeah, it's funny. It really feels like, like Cassavetes is from New York and it kind of just feels like this is what he did. Like, it feels like those are the places he went to. This is the music he listened to. Um, one scene I really love is when Lelia and Tony run away from the guy she was dating in Central Park. And like, it seems like they run so far, but they probably were just like in the same part of the park. Like, I highly doubt they like went to the other side of the park while they were running like they probably just like ran in the same spot and like filmed in like on a hill near the benches and I think that that's like you really see so much creativity out of this movie and the use of like um the use of crowds is like really great and like that scene just made it seem like there was such large scope to the film even though they probably didn't shoot that large of an area but like the way that was filmed it just felt like they covered so much of the park and were like really running away mm -hmm. um even though it was probably just on like a couple of people like chasing them through probably like 200 feet of the park mm -hmm. I hear you 100% like how New York can make it feel like like being in New York you think of like big flashy so like it's almost as if it's a different like setting atmosphere in every single shot whether it be in the apartment building in the park it's like all unique and I yeah. think that it being in New York is super super well you said Cass Betty's is from New York so what better place is there to film than in New York um I just feel like New York with it being filmed in New York that just comes with such a uh, recognizable mood um, and for independent films and low budget films I think this is a super important aspect because um, you want your audience to relate to what they're watching and I feel like since it's in New York City it's something that we all can relate to kind of on some level um, especially with the jazz in the background it just reminded me of some like I don't know New York in the 1950s I think it was perfectly captured yeah um, perfectly it captured. works really cohesively um mm. something that I found funny is I actually just watched the movie I don't know if any of you guys have seen it plan nine from outer space no and it's a low budget movie it's considered like one of the worst movies of all time like it's a horror movie and it is so bad but it's like amazing and when I watched that movie I went there's no way in hell that Romero did not watch this movie a hundred times over and then make Night of the Living Dead like there were so <laughs> many parallels like it's basically about like aliens come to earth and bring the life to bring the dead to life because they're trying to get in contact with like earth and something that that film did so wrong was they used so many, it's such a low budget and they used so many locations that none of them really, you couldn't really tell where they were. They used like B-roll, like random B-roll footage from like LA. And mm. then they used like, like a graveyard that they use like, like there are just so many scenes where none of them work together. Mm -hmm. And I think what we see in Night of the Living Dead, which Cassavetes also does is having um, kind of like this cohesiveness to where all the shots take place 
even if there's a lot of different locations or a bunch of small, lo like very little locations, you really need this cohesiveness that every location works together and feels like you're in the same like mm. diegetic universe. Mm -hmm. So true. Because I think that makes up the magic of like low budget independent films is if you can actually believe that this is where they are. Mm -hmm. Because, like, I think that if it was, like, really weirdly filmed and you, like, never really realized that this was in New York, it would be totally different. If he only filmed, like, indoors, maybe, or on, like, weird fake sets, like, not having these giant skyscrapers and, like, all the flashing lights of Broadway and Central Park, I think that that really adds to, like, what makes this movie so realistic is that it, like, it's so cohesive. Yeah, just that, and that was beautifully well said, but um, just like the, the mise-en-scene of everything in the, like the diners and the parks and the streets, just it really added to the flavor of his like portrayal of a day in the life of someone just growing up in New York City and just going about their day and their experiences. Yeah, New York is like the ultimate mise-en-scene. Yeah. Like you just go there and you have the mise-en-scene of New yep. York and you don't need to do anything to it. I say this as a New Yorker, so. <laughs> um, what part of New York we, are you from? I live in Manhattan. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think this brings us to our time for -da -da -da, a fun fact. Today's fun fact on Manon du Jour is that actor Anthony Ray, who plays Tony, famous father, is Nicholas Ray, best known for his movie Rebel Without a Cause. And the very fun fact of this, which is actually a very, very sad fact, is Anthony ended up having an affair with his father's wife, his stepmother, uh, Gloria Graham, and ended up marrying her a couple years after his father divorced her. <laughs> so that's our fun fact for um, this show's uh, today. And There's also a very large age gap between... <laughs> His son and his ex-wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it reminds me of some other uh, famous directors we know who marry their uh, their children. <laughs> Looking at you, Woody Allen. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get back into the show. <laughs> um, One of my favorite scenes was um, the sex scene between Lilia and Tony. I have some quotes picked out that um, I think maybe if I read them, we can just all like dissect them because I think they're like really great. Um, so after they have sex and she loses her virginity, she says, I was so frightened. I kept saying to myself, you mustn't cry. If you love a man, you shouldn't be so frightened. And then he responds saying, it's only natural. There isn't a girl in the world that wouldn't feel that same way. And I think that every single line carries such an important thing. Um, she's saying she's like frightened during sex and like that if you love a man, you should never be so frightened. And this just immediately like set off my sensors for like, that is like telling women that like, if a man is like, if you're scared of a man and you love him, you shouldn't be scared of him. So, like, if you're in an abusive relationship and you love a man, like, you shouldn't be frightened of him. Um, and then him saying that it's natural that every girl should, like, feel fear when she had sex was, like, insane to me. And I think, like, this scene was just, like, so great. It was shocking. I was uncomfortable for this scene as well because... Like, there was also, she was saying, like, don't touch me, like, don't touch me. And then he kept touching her, and I was like, and it was just like, I don't know. It just, it was confusing to me. I, I didn't understand, like, why, I don't know. It's probably because I'm not a female. Like, I don't under, well, well I couldn't relate to the male either. I was like, why are you doing this? You're saying don't touch her. She's saying she's scared of you. Just let her go home. Why are you still like following her into her house? It didn't make sense to me at all. Yeah, I think that it really like 
frustrating though. It's really kind of poignant about the fact that like he clearly has like no idea on how it should be for a woman. Like, mm. and I think that's kind of shown throughout. There's another point that I'm sure we'll discuss at later on about when it kind of blows up with him where they find out that where he finds out that she's black and has black brothers Mm -hmm. and um I think that him saying it's only natural there isn't a girl in the world that should that wouldn't feel the same way kind of points out how much of an idiot he is thinking that like every woman should have pain during sex and should be frightened during it and I think that this is a really like realistic scenario for women especially like women who are told that like um all of these things about sex and are sexually repressed and um, telling women that they, sh- that like this man telling her that she should be frightened and it's natural, like kind of as like a woman who's grown up learning exactly the opposite um, as I've like been so lucky and privileged to. I think that this is just such like a great scene. And a lot of this movie is, isn't scripted. And a lot of it was just them doing it themselves and like Mm. um freestyling the whole thing so this just makes me really interested whether like what if this is scripted um because I just thought that that scene was like so it was like really great it was like one of my favorite scenes in a movie I've ever seen did any of you notice um the it was like in the sex scene that you were talking about there was like a like almost like an African looking mask above the bed in the scene. I thought that was kind of interesting in like the point of like race and stuff, just between Lelia, who at the time Tony thought was white, but then he found out she was black later on. And I don't know, I just, I don't know if anyone noticed that too. I didn't, but that's really interesting. It's like cultural, like he, like he likes the culture of like people of color but he doesn't like people of color it's like but as soon as he found out she was black he was like this is like i don't want any part of this or anything like that so yeah um there's another line that really stuck out to me which was when tony comes back to the house after being kicked out and tells ben to tell lelia i realize there's no difference between us And I think it really, like, it's such a subtle line. And, like, no one in the movie says anything about it afterwards. Like, no one's like, oh, my God, look at what he just said. Like, there's no difference between us. And I think, like, all of these things are, like, really subtle. Like, the race, like, when when Hugh and Tony get into the fight, neither of them say a single thing about being Black, about race, about being racist. Like, none of them say anything when they get in that fight. Um, It's not until later that Hugh says, I don't want you dating a racist or whatever he says. And I think that it just shows like Tony's ignorance and also just like white people's ignorance in general saying like, I realize there's no difference between us. And it's kind of like um, race erasure, erase, yeah. Um, Him saying that like Lelia doesn't have, like there's no difference between them, um, denies Lelia of any, hardship that she goes through from being black because by him saying there's no difference of me a white man and you a black woman it kind of everything about her intersectional personality uh, like who she is as a person being black being a woman having black siblings it being raised in a black household possibly um all gets erased and it's kind of just like you're just like me and it doesn't matter what hardships you've been through And so I think those are like really subtle things that the movie does that are like so realistic, yet they don't like play into it too much. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Going off of what you said about how, uh, who was it? Uh, Tony comes back and is like, yeah, there's no difference between us. And then that message just never even gets relayed to Lilia. It just shows like there wasn't a lot of resolution in the movie going off of also how you said at the beginning when Lilia was grabbed on the street and they just moved past it. There was no resolution there. For me, there was just no resolution throughout most of the movie. Like for Ben, how he doesn't know what he's doing after he gets beaten up 
and Hugh, he could only play in Chicago, right? Like one of their gigs got canceled. So there just didn't seem to be like any wrap up or sum to any of the plot, like or subplots of the movie. So I feel like um, that may have been intentional for some yeah. aspects of the movie. Um, since just because like in from my, in my opinion um like independent films are supposed to like replicate real life and just kind of be um you know like shot in the in the same time period like real life events kind of um outside of the hollywood studio um and like violet said before i feel like a lot of the things that happened in the film like with like uh, towards women and the racial uh, issues that were presented in the film, they didn't get really resolved. But I feel like in real life, a lot of the times things just don't get resolved like that. And but which is really good in 2020, we're working towards resolving these issues, and we're finally calling them out. And in the 1950s it was clear that these issues were not being addressed and it was it was clear that people were on the stronger side of racism as in opposition to it. Yeah, I think that ultimately, if it feels not satisfying in the, at the end of this movie for you, it's like completely true, but at the same time, completely false that it's unsatisfying. Because I think in some ways it's like, like you said, it's intended that like their issues still continue. Mm. Like you cannot solve like Lelia's oppression of a as a woman. You cannot solve like Hughes. Oh, I thought. Um, you cannot solve like the race issues that like Hugh and Ben deal with. You can't solve any of these things. Mm. But then at the same time, I do feel like there's some sort of resolution for each character. Like Ben, after he gets beat up, he like realizes that that's not what he wants in life that he like doesn't want to keep he says like I don't understand why we can't like find a nice woman like another way like why do we have to go like trolling the streets drinking every night and he seems to kind of come to an understanding about that and like Hugh kind of settles and compromises with Rupert at the end when the two of them go to Chicago he's like let's like I think you're the best person to like help me with my career and like I think you think the same about me and like we're a team and I'm not compromising with you. And so like, let's go to Chicago and let's do it. And like their relationship kind of like comes to the standpoint when they're in that station and it has like an ultimately a good resolution that the two of them kind of strengthen their relationship and like continue on with their lives and continue on with this career path that the two of them have chosen. And then Lelia, like we said, comes to this resolution that she's like a very strong woman like she comes to understand that like she doesn't need to be pushed around she doesn't need to follow what other women follow or are like told to follow in life and that she can do things her own way and it still makes her just as much as a woman and in fact even like a stronger one by doing so yeah I think that was just that's a really good point I think the whole just leaving it kind of unfulfilled at the end was part of what it like bothered me in this movie in some ways because I just felt like it, there should be a, um, an ending to the stories more like more resolution but um, I kind of see the intentional side of it and in some ways now that I'm like thinking about it and hearing what you all have to say about that um, it almost made me realize that I kind of what, what, I, what kind of bugged me about the movie was that I wanted to watch more of it and see where their lives went like further. Like I was kind of like not ready for it to end like where it was and how they just kind of like stopped. Like I wanted to see where their lives went, you know what I mean? Um, just the rest of the way, so. Yeah. Um, one scene that I thought was great that doesn't, it's not really as much of kind of a, a very intellectual discussion around it, but the fight scene at the end, mm. I thought that was like a great scene, um, especially when the guy like punches um, Ben in the face 
and it cuts to um, a shot where you're looking through Ben's eyes and the guy just comes up with his fist and like pounds at the camera twice. Um, and I just thought that was like a great, like, it doesn't really look that realistic. It doesn't really feel like you're Ben. It kind of just feels like the guy's punching towards the camera. Um, but in a way, it's just such a great like shot for something that's like, okay, well, how do we show these guys are like getting beaten up right now and really like put the audience in their shoes? Well, let's make this guy mm-hmm. fake punch the camera, um, which I thought was just like such a great, <laughs> such mm-hmm. a great shot. And then like, um, what's his name? The one of the guys, not Dennis at the end, he like carries the two of them over his like shoulder and they're all like slugging out of there. Um, I thought that that was like a really great scene. <laughs> um, I'm curious to for what you guys have to say about how um, the soundtrack of this film impacted the overall film, like in specific, um, the, the dubbing of the sound in some certain instances, like you said earlier, uh, Violet, about the dialogue and how it was kind of restored from what it previously was and if that had any overarching effects into the film, whether it be quality, convention of meaning. At first, when I saw, when I first started watching the movie and I saw like the dubbing over of like the voices, like when they weren't really speaking, but there was voices talking, I was really confused. And I thought like, it was just some weird structure, like how the way like the movie was just gonna be like that. And I was like, is that some like, unknown like low budget film thing that I haven't heard about and then it just was I realized it was just the restoration of it because a lot of scenes then picked up the the sound and the lips syncing up and stuff like that but um, I just thought that was interesting it just took me by surprise in the beginning definitely Mm -hmm. it kind of works though it kind of feels like it's like a stylistic choice (laughs) Like, before I realized that it was, like, a restoration of the movie, it, like, felt like it was very stylistic. I mean, the speaking is obviously, regardless of, like, um, some of the sound not being audible and them having to do some, like, voiceovers for it, like, the speaking choice is, like, very specific to Cassavetti in this movie, um, and I think that definitely, like, when I watched this movie, it was, like, so indicative of Scorsese and how his characters talk. And, like, at first I was like, oh, my God, this is, like, Cassavetes is doing it like Scorsese. But then you realize, wait, Scorsese took it from Cassavetes. Mm. And that's, like, how, like, some, like, small independent films, like, impact, have such a large impact. Because they don't have they don't have a rhyme or reason. You can do them however you want. Like you have to be creative. And as we talked about, like limitation forces creativity and it creates like new ways to do things. If you have all the same, if you have all the money in the world, you do things the same. Um, to make a movie, you do things the same as every other block movie's made, mm. blockbuster movie. But mm. if you have limitations, you have to find new creative ways to do it. And that's why I think that independent movies and low budget movies are so famous, like, and are such groundwork for other movies because, like, you really have to adapt and create all of these new techniques for them. I feel like that's really at the core of uh, the low budget film uh, that we just watched. Um, It proves that you don't need a lot of money to produce a good film because although there were flaws in the film, it almost seems seamless in a way, the way that the scenes transitioned and the way that the story progressed slowly, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, And I think that being in New York helped with that a lot, Um, just being able to transition from scene to scene, having new things in each scene, but also a sense of familiarity in each scene it was huge um and you see these new movies now with all these special effects and there's millions and millions of dollars being put into them but when compared to a movie from the 1950s that was extremely low budget um was produced outside of a big studio you can just see that it's it's not all about the money 
when it comes to making an exceptional film. Yeah, and I think you're really right, Lawson, about the soundtrack. Like, this jazz music really adds to the whole movie as a whole. I think that without the jazz, this movie would be severely lacking because it's kind of the sense of, like, this free-flowing jazz music, this very, like, funky beat that, like, there's no, um, there's no lyrics to it. It's just kind of this free-flowing, very, like, swinging music that's, like, very chillaxing, I guess, mm. is the vibe of it. And I think that adds to the movie kind of being free flowing. It's not really that structured. It's very loose. And that's, I think the music just works perfectly in tandem with that. And like, when I hear the music of it, it just works so well with the movie and with all of the characters. Yeah, the uh, the soundtrack of like the, I guess it's kind of almost like the score, the jazz was, but um, it almost seemed like in some uh, scenes, like where you're on the street of New York City and the jazz is playing, that it would just be like, you'd just be walking down the street in 1950 and you just hear jazz coming out of clubs yeah. and like doors and stuff. So it really added to the sense of like just being in New York City. And I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, it's amazing that you say that because I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Like it was, uh, it was amazing how they would have scenes of them walking down the street and talking, and then you'd also hear um, it this lone trumpet or this uh, a trio of saxophonists playing while the dialogue was happening, but you could hear it so crisp and clear. Like it was almost as if you would be walking down the street in New York and. I thought that was so cool. Um, yeah. It kind of reminds me of like that scene in a movie where like they, when they walk, like the trumpet plays, like it's like, boo -doo, boo -doo, oh, boo -doo, yeah. boo -doo. but like it works and it's totally not distracting. Yeah. <laughs> like it's like the, the music perfectly understands like the humanistic patterns of the characters mm. in like a non confronting way, like the walking mm. trumpets do. Mm. Um, but I think it really just goes in total like Cassavetes just really makes this seem like this is the music they listen to but not even listen to this is just the music that plays all the time mm. like this is how they talk not even just in the movie but this is just like their universe like it really feels mm. so realistic to who it they does. are and to what the city is So do we have any last closing statements before we finish off? Has anyone's opinion changed or like come to a new understanding? Um, honestly, I've kind of come to a new understanding of seeing the film in different ways, just hearing some of your points. Um, that I like the intentional, like how it was not supposed to be resolved because I didn't really see that when I first watched it. I was just more just like frustrated that I didn't get to see more or it wasn't resolved in the way I hoped it was going to be resolved, but I kind of see the intentional aspect of that. So I kind of like hearing that point and that definitely helped me understand the movie and, and like what Cassavetes was going for a little bit more in the low budget film. So I definitely liked going over that in this discussion. Yeah, I think this is a really difficult movie. Like we had already talked about it in class, but this movie definitely is way more subtle and way more kind of confronting um, than some of the other movies we watched. And I think that like discussing it, it really like made me enjoy the movie way more because I kind of totally. even, like talking about the things I thought about, hearing the things you guys thought about kind of deepened my understanding of it. And like, as I talked and as we discussed, I kind of like, understood the characters more I understood like what Cassavetes wanted us to see from this more um so I really think like this is the type of movie and like sh and like independent films are the type of movie where like directors want you to go and talk afterwards they want you to like discuss what you've seen and like have difference of opinions and like come to conclusions about society 
that aren't like forced to to you but kind of like that you draw from yourself yeah i thought it was a really good song i'm really happy i i really like these discussions personally like just like it helps me understand the movie more and i love hearing about everybody's interpretations of different scenes like I, I just love that um well if there's no closing remarks i think that might be a wrap i think so uh, thanks thank for you coming to, to our, our probably yeah. one audience member <laughs> on uh You've watched uh, Manon du Jour, so mm. <laughs> jazz hands.